Good morning again, Polaris. I'm surprised Alex allowed me to put that up there. It's too nerdy for him. <clears throat> we are going to wrap up the Ephesians series talking about the armor of God. Now, that clip is from the 2008 movie Iron Man. Now, Iron Man came out, and I remember vividly going to Canton's uh, theater with my, a couple of my college buddies. We already, had already graduated. We met there to go watch Iron Man. And I remember, you know, I'm, this is my nerd coming out, by the way. Like, Iron Man wasn't like the big dog hero in the Marvel Universe, believe it or not. Like, in the comics, he was a, bit, he was a part of it, but he wasn't the, like the focal point. So when you see Tony Stark put on the suit like that for the first time, like, okay, I'm blown away. Changed my thoughts of Iron Man, and all of a sudden he's the man, and uh, it, it, it changed like the whole, and now everything's about the Marvel Universe, and even though it's kind of gone down a little bit, that was like the, the first high point. And I love it because Robert Downey Jr. became Tony Stark, and he is truly Iron Man. But what does Iron Man have to do with Ephesians? It's simply put, we're talking about the armor of God. Armor is basically defined as, as metal formed in something that will protect a soldier in battle. And if the Bible talks about armor, obviously it means that someone's at war. And if we are that someone and we are at war, who are we at war against? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 says this. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that you, so that the day, when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Paul tells us that we have to put on an armor. But Why? Why must we put on armor? He, a couple of verses before this, he, he gets a little deeper. He says in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and, and mighty in his power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take on uh, and stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I'm going to say something and say, maybe tell you something you may not want to hear this morning or, or maybe you don't want to admit it's true uh, or, or maybe you know and you've known your whole life uh, there is an entity in the world. Some people call him devil. Some people call him Satan. Some call him uh, Beelzebub, the enemy. I like always think about uh, in the 90s there was a, the SNL skit with the church lady. Satan? There is an evil in this universe. And that evil actually has dominion on our earth. Satan has real power. He has real effect. He, uh, he helps guide towards the most evil of things. But I want to pause right there. Yes, there is a Satan. Yes, there is the enemy. But that doesn't give us like a free pass, by the way. Like, yes, there are an influencer in our world. But the, the, the idea of the devil made me do it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily hold up in the, in the court of law, nor does it hold up with, with Jesus. But because of Jesus, we can fight. Because of Jesus, we have that forgiveness. And our sermon today isn't going to be all about Satan, but I do want to establish that there is a reason why we need armor. Um, the world has tried its best to convince us that there is nothing that's fighting against us, that there, there is no real thing as a Satan or a devil. There, there is nothing that's influencing us. And the truth be told, there is. There is a very mighty power trying to fight us. And that power started way back in Genesis. He first appeared in the form of a snake or a serpent. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, the most crafty of any of the, of the wild animals the Lord had made, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree in this middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent says to the woman, 
For God knows that when you eat from, from it, you will, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw the fruit in the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye uh, and so desired to gain that wisdom. She took it, ate from it, and she gave it to her husband who was with her and ate it. The first appearance of the serpent, of Satan, lays the groundwork for how evil and sin works. He comes into a, a, a situation where Adam and Eve were just doing life. They weren't trying to you know, mess with anything. They were doing what God asked them to do. And all of a sudden the serpent comes around and says, Hey, did God really say that? He makes you start to question all of a sudden, is, you know, am I being truthful? Is God being truthful with me? And he manipulates God's word saying, you weren't, you're not going to truly die. In fact, God's just trying to prevent you from being like him. And you see the manipulation, you see the lies, you see, see the mistrust in God that, that he gives us. We can see that same pattern in our own world, in our own lives. No one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lie, cheat, hurt, and steal. I'm going to break people apart. I'm going to make people feel worse than me. I'm going to do things to hurt others as much as I can. No one ever wakes up and tells, them, tells themselves that's what they're going to do. It's the small little whispers. It's the being convinced that maybe God isn't for you. Maybe being convinced that, you know, if I really, what's it really going to hurt? Who is it really going to hurt? Maybe God doesn't even care about me. And that evil, that Satan, that enemy influences us little by little by little. John 10.10, 10, the first part of it, kind of really defines, I think, who the enemy is. He says the thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. And think about it. That's what he's really good at. Satan wants to kill your joy. Satan wants to steal your peace. Satan wants to destroy your reputation and who you are. And that's why Paul says we need to stand up to the evil schemes, that we need to, our struggle isn't with flesh and blood, but it's with the powers of evil and darkness. James tells us in James 4, 7, he goes, Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Paul then says in 2 Corinthians 10, he goes, For through, through, the, through we live in the world, we do not wage war the way the world does. The weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. We are in a spiritual battle. It's real. And I, I tell our students this sometimes. I go, if you can like, imagine the roof rip, ripped off this building and see what's happening supernaturally around us, you'd be amazed. There's constantly something fighting for your attention, for your, your, your soul, for, for the things you do and, and, and desire and crave. And if there is an enemy that's trying to fight us that hard, there is a need to have armor. And we're going to go through the, the six different pieces that, that Paul talks about in the armor of God. But I, I, it really comes down to one thing. If we're going to fight, we need Jesus. We need him in our lives. We need to speak his name. We need him to be the thing that drives us. And when doing so, we can start putting on each of these pieces. But without Jesus as the focal point, without Jesus as the thing that drives us, none of this works. This is just really nice worded ways of saying to prepare yourself for battle. But Jesus has to be at the focal point. But Paul starts with, a belt buckle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, in a practical sense, a belt does one important thing. Is keep your pants up. Because you can't go running and the pants go down. In, in, a, in a like battle situation, a, a belt buckle would have also had a place for your sword, a place to put anything important. Think like Batman's super awesome belt that has all the you know, cool things. That's what, you know, practically speaking, a belt buckle would do. But in the world of Paul, he's saying we need the belt buckle of truth. 
we live in a society that's trying to really wipe out the idea of truth. There is only one truth, and that's Jesus. Everything else is a pretender. We live in a world where we say you've got to live your truth or live out your truth, true self. And it kind of takes away from the only truth. See, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only direction. Without him, this is nothing can happen, and we can't fight anything that comes before us. And the enemy is really good at taking away the belt buckle of truth. Because if he can convince you that Jesus and God is not true or they're not real, then he's already won. So Paul tells us, put on the belt buckle of truth, Jesus' truth, the only truth. And the second piece of armor kind of connects to the truth. The second part of Ephesians 6.14, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place. Now, Soldier speaking wise, a breastplate would cover probably from your neck down to your torso. The, the belt buckle would actually connect to the breastplate. And what a breastplate can, uh, protects is your vital organs, your heart, your lungs, your stomach. All those things that, you know, if something penetrates, you could die. Righteousness is a churchy word. But essentially righteousness means just being right with God. When the enemy, Satan, entered the world and, and convinced Adam and Eve to take a bite of this fruit and all of a sudden sin enters this world, for generations upon generations, people were trying to figure out how to be right with God. Throughout the Old Testament, they were using animals to, as small sacrifices to maybe have atonement for a season. But that would always have to be redone over and over and over again until Jesus answers the, the fray. Once again, it goes back to Jesus. Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate thing that covers our sins so we can now be right with him. And so when we say yes to Jesus, when we become a part of his way of life, we then put on this breastplate that protects us. His sacrifice makes us right. And that righteousness protects our vital organs. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, Declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has risen him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And what Paul and Jesus is saying is, listen, that breastplate of righteousness comes through saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So righteousness is yours through that. And so you are protected. That vital organ of your soul is now protected through Jesus' blood. The, first, the third piece of armor is kind of a pair of shoes. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. And put, your feet fit, put with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, um, I'm not shoe guy. Now, there's a generation of teenagers and young adults that are all about shoes. Here's the problem with David Ivey. I wear a 16 4E. <laughs> they don't make, whoa, well, they don't make uh, shoes at any store for me. Uh, and my grandmother would always, like, always emphasize to me, you have to have a good pair of shoes. Without a good pair of shoes, it, it, life's just rough. And I would laugh because I was going through a season in life growing up where my feet just kept on growing and I couldn't find shoes. And there were times I had to squeeze my very large, flat, and wide feet into like a 14. And, and trust me, telling you, that's not fun to try to run in a shoe that's like twice smaller than your foot and definitely not more narrow. And I, but I understood what my grandma was saying because... Without having feet, strong feet, protected feet, you can't run. A soldier in, in the real world, one of the most important pieces of equipment outside of his weapon is his boots. Because you can't run towards the enemy if you don't have good feet. And you can't run away from the enemy to protect yourself and others if your feet aren't right. And then Paul tells us that we need to put our spiritual boots on. 
We need the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That readiness comes from knowing scripture. That readiness comes from not just, hey, I have a Bible, but actually knowing what's in it, memorizing, tattooing that information on your heart, preparing yourself for what is to possibly come, being ready at any time that when the world throws the, 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 the stuff at you, when moral choices come your way, when the enemy seems louder than anything else, that you are already ready to go running to either defend or to attack. It is such an important thing to memorize Scripture, to know God's Word. One of the earliest things in my ministry, I I was, you know, mid-20s when I started this whole ministry thing, and I remember uh, sitting down with my first, like, small group, and it was in, back in the, the cinema days when we were over in the, in the plaza. And I remember having a middle school kid look me in the eyes and say, how do you know if it's Satan and how do you know if it's Jesus? And like the, the young kid in me is like, oh, I've got to answer this question now. And it took a second, it took a breath. And I'm like, you know, the only way you know what voice it is is if you know what's in Scripture. Because if you know what's in Scripture, anything counter to that is not Jesus. And I still believe that to this day. You have to know what's in Scripture so you can be ready for when things come your way, when things go south, when tragedy strikes, when the the bad medical news hits you, when the financial situation isn't great, when your kid at home is struggling with all kinds of things, you need to have that in your heart and ready to go so you're ready to run, fight, defend. The enemy is really good at making you think you don't need to have that kind of readiness. That's what he's good at. But I encourage you to put on those boots and be ready. The fourth piece of armor is a shield. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows from the evil evil one. The enemy is looking to take you down. He reminds you of your best and, and, and biggest failures. He reminds you of the hurt you have given others and the hurt has been given to you. Uh, he reminds you constantly in, uh, of, the, of the possible doubts that you have in your life. You're not worthy. You should be ashamed Yes, forgiveness, peace, and love, and healing, that's for everyone else but you. Yes, Jesus is, yeah, he died on the cross, but you've done too much. You don't deserve, you you can't have that freedom anymore. You've disqualified yourself. How often have we looked ourselves in the mirror? How often have we looked ourselves in the eyes and, and think those horrible thoughts? And because of that, we've disqualified ourselves from God and faith. But when we hold the shield of faith, we understand that, yes, we are sinful. But because of Christ, our sins are scattered as far as the east from the west. We understand that there's nothing we can do that can separate us from the love of God. When we hold up that shield, we can have that freedom because that faith comes from Jesus, the thing that cannot be defeated. And really, this leads to the fifth piece of armor, the helmet of salvation. When you take up the helmet of salvation, Ephesians chapter 16, 7, salvation as a helmet makes complete sense because outside of your boots, if you, something happens to your head, it's game over. Like if, that's why a soldier can't take off his helmet in battle because, you know, no brain, no movement, Right. That's why the NFL spends billions of dollars every year pouring into how to make a perfect helmet because if they don't make the perfect helmet, they're not going to have players to play their sport. Uh, That's why motorcycle laws exist. You know, no brain, no life. But Paul tells us the helmet of salvation is Jesus. He is the source of light. He is the thing that's going to keep you safe. He is the source that will deliver you from all the stuff Without Jesus, there is no deliverance. Without Jesus, there is no salvation. And so we need to put on his helmet. 
And the last piece of armor really isn't necessarily armor at all. It's a sword. Ephesians chapter 6, the last part of 17. The sword of the Spirit, which once again is the Word of God. The Bible is a weapon. It is made to use to fight and defend. If you are not pouring into Scripture, you are allowing your faith not to strengthen. If you are not understanding what is in the Word of God, you're going to be defenseless. All the other armor is nice, but without a sword, you can't fight. Without a sword, you can't defend. We look at this armor of God and how it's explained. And like I said at the beginning, it all comes back to Jesus. Jesus is the focal point of this spiritual armor. But in the chapter before him, Paul gives us a little insight on why, once again, this armor is important. Because Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16 says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. And what Paul wants us to know is that to live with wisdom is to understand there is only one truth, and that is Jesus. We live with wisdom to understand that there is an enemy that wants to destroy you, and the only way to fight that enemy is Jesus. Each part of the armor of God uh, really comes down to knowing that you need God. You can't do this without Jesus. And when you have him on your side on a daily routine, in a daily life, Jesus' faith is not just on a Sunday morning. It's not just coming here checking the box. It is a lifestyle. It is who you are. If you believe that Jesus is a Christ, it's not just a religious event. It's everything that you are, is defined by you. Everything you do, everything you're about, everything you click on, everything that, that moves your heart one way or the other has to be defined by Jesus. Because if it's not, you've, you've opened yourself up from a, to an attack by an enemy that is real that wants to destroy you. And so I encourage you, put on that truth. I encourage you to get into God's word and ready yourself. I encourage you to stand strong with the shield so your, your faith can be strong wherever you go. I encourage you to make sure that Jesus' salvation is placed directly in your head. I encourage you to make sure the breastplate of righteousness is right where it belongs to protect your vital organs. I encourage you to sharpen your sword that is the Bible. And when Satan comes, because he will, you'll be ready. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. I want to read this, then the band's going to come out and play one last song. It says this. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for, for all of God's people. We need to be talking to God. We need to be praying. There are times that we just need to speak Jesus' name. It is all about Jesus. About Jesus in your life and your family and, and, and who you are. The armor of God is a fun little thing, to, you know, a way to remember certain things about your faith, but truly it comes down to Jesus. If you want to be ready for the enemy, if you want to send him going the other direction, if you want to defeat him because he's been defeated by the blood, it's all about Jesus. We stand with me as we pray. Father God, we are thankful for your son. Thankful for Paul to giving us the, 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 this, this armor, this idea of how we can prepare ourselves to fight a real enemy. God, help us stop kidding ourselves that there is an entity in this universe that wants us to fail and remind us that the only defeat is through you. You can defeat anything he throws at us. But help us be prepared. Help us prepare our hearts and our minds. Uh, help us prepare our very souls. Because you are the only thing that can save us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>